Welcome to College Football Roundtable, your source for college football coverage, including major storylines, playoffs, can't miss game previews, and picks each week. Join your hosts, Dan, Rob, and Jordan at the roundtable for a show unlike anything else. As for Football presents the College Football Roundtable. When your college football struggles are now over, you no longer have to play EA college football to get your college football fix. We are at week zero. Welcome back. It is now time for college football. Welcome back, Trash Talkers. I'm your host, Rob, at the uh, College Football Roundtable, or you can call it Ring Knocker Radio. We have no NCO right now, so uh, we are rudderless <laughs> to <laughs> give a good nod to Mark. Uh, on the show, but like the reality of it is, is we're here to bring you the college football roundtable, talk about what's going on in the pantheon of college sports, and particularly football. It's week zero, guys. Uh, we've got Dano Ikebesa calling out of Coastal Connecticut. We've got Mark the Witty Mitty joining us again. It's always nice to have him on the show. It's like we like Navy 364 days a year, not really, but uh, we'll certainly bring you on to get your insights into uh, a fellow rival. Uh, college football team and like the one question i have and something that you don't have to answer right now but think about it because navy's been in the american conference for a while and uh you know informal informal uh rivalries have, have formed so like you can say army north texas is like a rivalry right that's going to happen and it's going to get some substance to it now that they're going to play every year every other year but think about which team outside of army it's kind of like that AAC nemesis that uh, Navy faces every year as we get into yeah. this. But other yeah. than that, how are we doing today, guys? Uh, good. And I would just like to point out that the, the Navy show that we did last year was easily one of the most popular shows that we did all year. Um, so, you know, we doubled down on success and a bit, you know, when 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 our brothers from the sea uh, bring us audience, we we bring them back on that. That is how this works. So. Um, Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. We really do appreciate it quite a bit. Thank you. I, my life is in uh, still such a state of disrepair that I'm here to talk football with Army football fans. But I'll take the <laughs> I'll take the crap from my side of the uh, of, of the rivalry, and we'll, we'll have a good time tonight. Yeah, uh, good. I mean, we appreciate you coming on. And again, like what we're trying to do with this show, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the outline. But what we're trying to do in this show is we're trying to widen the, the aperture for the people that may not have the appetite for service academy sports, right? We now are both in the American conference, both army and Navy. So we're going to expand our American conference coverage. And so that's something cool to talk about, like the history of the American conference. It's a great article on the ask for football website, cheap plug for Omar. But the reality of it is, is, is he did a really great job breaking down how people ended up in the AAC and so that's just one of the first steps of how we're going to talk about it. But we talk about this uh, in general uh, for college football because we all like college football outside of Army. Uh, we like to talk about the service academies. We talk about the FCS academies as well because they don't get a lot of love and any other promotions out there. And, uh, you know, call us Paul Feinbaum crazy for covering FCS service academies, but that's what we're going to do. And then, again, this is a great show to give our uh, our audience an opportunity to interact with us. And to expand the audience as we go into the American. And we're going to give us our, our picks for the week. And those picks could be helpful or not helpful, depending upon how you go. Uh, I will tell you, you don't want to take any betting guidance from this guy. But when Trigger Joe is on the show, like you want to listen to his picks because that guy's won more seven game parlays than I have ever seen. He is a savant when it comes to, you know, working the FanDuel angles. So that being said, we do have a sponsor here at As for Football. And it is Jocelyn Bradley. She is a realtor. If you are PCSing to Fort Liberty or anywhere else in the United States, we have a realtor for you. Jocelyn is a veteran who spent her Army career in logistics, and she discovered her passion for making a difference in people's lives. She's committed to helping her clients find their dream homes when they're in the, the market, and she provides exceptional service when she's working for you. Jocelyn has an extended network of veteran realtors who can help support you move anywhere in the country. So if you're in the market for a home, Jocelyn should be your first call. She's decided to support us here at As for Football, which is awesome. She is a great person to, you know, help us 
keep the show going, but also help you find a home. So if you're looking for a place to stay, if you're not moving to Fort Liberty, or if you are coming to Fort Liberty, we've got a bunch of young lieutenants that should be finishing up courses or getting ready to start them pretty soon. And you need a place to land. Jocelyn can help you find it. So reach out to her. There's a tab on the website at asforfootball.com. Click on it and get in touch with her and she will be ready to help you out. Dano, run down the 2023 standings for the service academies if you don't mind. Thanks. So Army finished six and six last year. And over the course of the full off season, I've come to think of it as a blessing in the long term that they didn't make two plays, one in, in a couple of different games and go eight and four because we're back to the future with the with the offense. Um, you know, two losses by a touchdown or less, two losses by less than ten points. You know, a lot of these games were super close. It, it was just a crazy season, but I, I think we got what we needed to get out of that season for better and worse. Um, and now I think everybody feels good about the direction the program is headed, and that's that's fine. Uh, I'm at peace with that. Air Force had the best start of any of the academies, winning eight straight, and then <sighs> they just crashed and burned. Um, they lost their last five, although uh, they did rebound to beat uh, James Madison in the bowl game. And, uh, and Mark, instead of me talking about Navy, why don't you tell us about Navy season? Because I'm sure you have more thoughts on it than I do, how they did last season. Yeah, I think I, you know, you don't have time for me to talk about this, but I always start with the firing of Ken Niamatololo at the end of the 2022 season in December after the Army-Navy game, uh, the beloved longtime coach. And this was a, a first year for the new head coach, Brian Newberry, who assumed the role after having been the defensive coordinator since 2019. Um, and he had what I consider to be a limited amount of time to hire an option coach, which was the directive from the athletic director that we stay with an option scheme, hired Grant Ch Chestnut from uh, Kennesaw State. Now, Grant Chestnut promised a, a different version of the triple option offense. And just like Army, Navy needed to find a solution um, after the blocking rule changes, which yeah. uh, I think were impactful to that offense. And even Kennesaw State, who had 10 or 11 wins for several years in a row, went five and six in 2022. Uh, nonetheless, we scooped up Grant Chestnut. I think overall, the, the five and seven record was disappointing. Um, the offense had a you know different pre-snap motions had different formations included two fullbacks it was interesting there were some signs of life against notre dame and then uh, at memphis on a weeknight which is a really tough place to play had 475 yards of total offense so things looked okay at the beginning of the season um but when things got bad for the offense you know they got really bad we lost sophomore quarterback blake horvath we had an injury to ty lavatai uh, brought in a freshman named brexton woodson for a couple games uh, had a 14 to nothing win at Charlotte where the offense looked pretty anemic and then a, a, a tough 17 to six loss at home versus Air Force. I was there for that. And then in my opinion, uh, the low part of the season was a 32 to 18 loss. We gave Temple their only AAC win in Philadelphia. Hmm. And at that time, you know, quarterback controversies, I think, are always overstated. But we brought Xavier Arline, the senior, out of the slot back room. He had become a slot back after playing lacrosse in the spring. And we tried to get back to a base offense in that game at Temple and just really couldn't move the ball. So I think the most frustrating th thing through the second half of the season was what, you know, a, a lack of real visibility from the fans and like, what exactly are we trying to do? Or Keenan Reynolds would say like, what's our identity? You know, what's our, what's our base? It was very tough offensively. Um, the good news is the defense as it has in the last several years improved as the year went on, pitched a couple shutouts in the second half of the season, which was, uh, which was really impressive. And then, <laughs> You know, just a disappointing loss to Army in a in a gut wrenching service academy slog type of game uh, at the end of the season that I can't even talk about because I don't think I watched all, watched it all that closely and, and couldn't watch it again. So overall, I think a, a, a disappointing season at five and seven, and a lot of changes coming into this next year. Thank you, appreciate that, Rob. Yeah, just real quick, I want to jump on that point. I think one of the things that we saw last season for all the academies was they weren't able to close games for some reason. Like closing out a game was not that great. Air Force did even worse because they didn't close out their season, you know, because I think Army and Navy had more wins in the tail end of the year than they did in the beginning. And so that was showing that steady improvement that you would like to see from your team regardless. But Air Force fell off a cliff. But I think majority of all the struggles that all three academies had was just being able to close out games. Like if it was close in the fourth quarter, like get your acid out. Cause you're going to have upset stomach because you just don't know how it's going to end. And 
I think that uh, that sends an extra bit of paranoia through your fan base when you're not closing out games every every year, winnable games that you you think you should have won. You know, but like Dan said, there is some goodness in in like not having the greatest season because all your assistant coaches don't get poached. So it may you know position wise help. You know, at least in Army's case, it allowed us to you know hold on to a talented uh, coach that got promoted to the offensive coordinator. And then in Navy's case, you were able to replace like the guy that you needed without having a whole bunch of other changeover. So that's helpful, but only time will tell if it it'll actually garner the results that that everybody wants to see, particularly in the fan base. Dano, if you don't mind, if you want to jump into the FPI rankings, yeah. Um... You know, a lot of times, I don't know what to make of these FPI rankings, but here are your top five as we head into the season. You've got number one, Georgia. Number two, Oregon. Seriously? Oregon? Number three, Texas. That's also bonkers. Number four, Ohio State. Number five, Bama. I, uh, yeah, Rob's got a note here saying it's disrespectful not to have Florida State and Michigan in the top 10. Uh, they were, ele- they're now ranked 11th and 12th. I don't know what's going to happen with Michigan and sanctions and all the rest of that stuff, but you know you got the the national champions dropping off the face of the earth. Florida State st- ought to still have a good team, I would think, at a minimum. Um, it, it's crazy, and this idea that Oregon is suddenly going to take over the world, like I feel like that's that's the refrain every single off season. Yeah, uh, I, I got. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. I got two quick points on that. So yeah. the two points that I always have: Oregon never lets me down. Like between week 10 and week 13, they're going to lose one. Like, like you could put that on your calendar, take that check to the bank. It's going to happen. I don't think they'll ever be undefeated. I just like, they've never let me down. But the other part of it is, is like, what are your guys' thoughts on Florida state? Do you think they're going to be a world beater or, you know, are they contender or pretender? Because come back to this, but I think that we'll all be talking about how good they are this time next week. Yeah. Well, for sure. But what I'm saying is, do you, do you think the, you know, with the expanded playoff, they got to get some love now, right? Your undefeated team, even though your quarterback was hurt, do they do they keep you out of the playoff for that, or or do they actually get a chance to to play their way into the tournament? You know, well, now with the expanded playoff, they're going to get every opportunity. But I, I mean, somebody from the AAC, uh, ACC is going to make it in there, if not two teams. That was the whole point. You know, with, let's expand to twelve so we can take three from each of the top four conferences. I mean, this is yeah. kind of where we are. Guys, I got a 13-year-old and uh, a lot of family members that are big Notre Dame fans, a lot of grads from Notre Dame. And it doesn't Florida State have a November date in South Bend? Uh, yeah. yeah, they do. Yeah, my 13-year-old wants game. tickets. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes for him. Yeah, for sure. That's that's a pretty interesting game. What do you? What about the Irish? How uh, how are they looking for those of us who haven't really glanced in their way during this offseason? Looking to surprise some folks, but I'm not sure that the uh, the real roster overhaul has happened there like it has at other places like Ohio State. Yeah, I think anyway. one of the things the, – the thing that disturbs me most about Notre Dame is, like, you had Sam Hartman. Like, that guy was, like, one of the greatest gunslingers, you know, the ACC had ever seen. He goes to Notre Dame and, like, he's a, he's a footnote, like, unsigned free agent. Like, he should have went to Notre Dame and balled out. Riley Leonard now is a different, you know – same same model, different quarterback. You know, you pull a guy from the ACC and put him in the, you know, put him in the driver's seat to see if he can actually win. Riley Leonard again had a habit of winning when he was at Duke. You know, can he overcome the specter? Because like, like who's the last great Notre Dame quarterback? Yeah. Can you name one? I can't. I I can't remember. You know. Like I remember back in the day when they were talking about Ron Pallets, and I'm dating myself by saying that, but he was like the last big thing to ever go to Notre Dame. And like I haven't seen that caliber of of you know buzz around a Notre Dame quarterback in a very long time. And so I, it, it'll be interesting to see what Marcus Freeman puts together with his season. And you know that could be a, that could be a great matchup in November. Or it could be like, why are we even watching this? You know, it just depends on which team shows up and, and if Notre Dame is down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow. That's a that's a deep cut. Very much so. Deep cut. So uh I just yeah. Um anyway, going back to FBI, Army is ranked 121st. Uh that is down from one oh two heading into uh 
and last year, Air Force is somehow ranked 87th, which I feel like just proves that nobody watches the Air Force in the offseason and they have no idea what's actually going on with that team. And uh, Navy is ranked 124th. Uh, so, again, that's Army and Navy must be equal, and somehow Air Force is going to be way better than either of them, which I think some people are in for a rude awakening as far as that is concerned. Uh, notable on Army schedule, uh, UTSA and Notre Dame should both both be tough games for Army men. No kidding. Um, and, uh, Rob, you already said North Texas and Army as the official rivalry. I mean, they probably played as much as any team outside of Army and Navy in that in the American Conference. Um, notable Air, for Air Force, they've got Utah State and San Jose State in September. Uh, Navy on the 21st of October. You can tell that the Air Force is worried about it because they already released the uniforms for that game, which is definitely a, a, a chicken chip move before the season even starts. Um, Rob, you have down here that they're going to win eight to ten games. My man, they're going to win five. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because the last time they had this much roster turnover was in 2017. And that year they had a – at least they had an experienced quarterback. This year they don't even have that. I'm telling yeah. you. It's, this is not an unprecedented event. It's just that people don't remember anything. Um, That's fair. Notable for Navy this season, uh, Notre Dame, of course, and Air Force, uh, Tulane and ECU in November. That Navy-ECU game is always one of my personal favorites. Uh, my dad was stationed at Lejeune back in the day. I've been to the campus of ECU a million times. And, uh, of course, Army-Navy. So, uh, yeah, man. Um, thoughts on the schedule. Of course, Air Force with zero Power 5 games. We know that one. Um, I don't know, man. Mark, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I think Air Force playing against the schedule that Navy's played in the last several years or even a schedule that Army has played in the last several years, they're not at nine or ten wins. Um, they're closer to they're closer to seven and five, and and you see that their their season typically falls apart when they face one of their better opponents on the road. The Mountain West has typically been really soft, and I don't know what they look like this year, but I I wouldn't be surprised if a if an Air Force team that's rebuilding with a, a new roster still gets seven or eight wins uh, just based on the looks of their schedule. I haven't seen it. Um, the question about Navy, the, the question about Navy and and uh, informal. Um, informal rivalries you'll hear different things from navy fans maybe somebody has a, a longer memory and, and remembers temple others love the ecu game my personal favorite is memphis uh mike normal who's who's down at florida state could not beat navy and that's probably what kept him from getting the job at tennessee which is a very strange thing to think about you know in the early years of the aac uh, navy beating memphis at memphis and spoiling some of their better seasons so really looking forward to having them at home this year and, and seeing what we can do against them. Still, even in a down year last year, played them real close uh, at Memphis on a weeknight, as I mentioned before. Um, so, yeah, so we'll see. One thing, you know, with the rivalry, rivalry, the games against Notre Dame for both Army and Navy, um, you know, I still wonder about this era of the post-transfer portal and, and older players in college football. I think it will be very interesting to see how each of these teams – can compete against a team like that. I know you had a disappointing game at LSU last year. Uh, I mentioned moving the ball a little bit in the opener against Notre Dame, but the truth is we got beat really bad and they ran the ball really effectively against what we thought was a pretty good run defense. So I'm just hoping that the differences in teams doesn't uh, grow too much between where we're at and the top schools. Yeah, I'm a little worried about that too. Um, over time with uh, not so much the transfer portal, but more with uh, the NIL, um, there's the, the, this maybe this is a time to talk about this and maybe it isn't but with the changes to um the transfer portal and well there, now there's no scholarship limits for for a long time uh, a lot of the power five teams were just taking fewer recruits bottom line which left better recruits to come to the service academies just kind of by the trickle down effect and we really saw that but with scholarship limits going away and you know people are just going to go for the money which um, what can you do and I, I, yeah, I worry about that too quite a bit. Yeah, I, I think really what you're going to get is, you know, the Power Four is going to turn into, you know, the the farm league for the NFL, and then you know, Group of Five is is going to become the best football in college. You know, and the reason why it is is because you're going to have athletes that are going to want to be at the schools that they're at to play. You know, maybe you'll have one offs of guys taken off because of, uh, you know, if you watch the uh, the AAC launch this season they had uh when Trent Dilfer came up he was talking about it and he was just like look 
I'm not trying to find kids that want millions of dollars. I want kids that play football and I want to establish a culture to do that. And that was echoed both from coach Munkin and from coach Newberry. So when you hear all these guys talking, at least from the service academies, or at least in the American conference, they're not looking at, you know, Hey, we're trying to sign these massive NIL deals. We're trying to find a kids that are right fit for their culture. So we can actually win some football games because I think, there's always parity. There's going to be parity in the group of five just because they don't have, you know, the backers, the donors, the, the, the NIL money, like rumor has it. And if I hear a rumor that Ohio state spent about 20 million in the NIL, then it's probably closer to 25 or 30, you know, cause they're not going to disclose how much money they're, you know, they don't have to stuff it in McDonald's bags anymore. So, you know, we don't know how much money is being exchanged to get those players there, but like you go from, you know, an average football team, and I say average, they only lost one game last year, but they have the, you know, they had the ability to freaking bring in Will Howard, who's a pretty solid QB out of K-State, and then Quinshawn Junkins, who is the number one rusher in the SEC. Like, how does that happen? No other schools are doing that. And even the schools that have the reputation like Notre Dame and long history of winning, you know, they can't even get players like that to come to their school. So it's like, yeah, academic rigor matters, but money is king right now. All right, so moving on to the AP top 10. Like, we'll hit these really quick because it's week zero and nobody cares. Number one is Georgia. Number two is Ohio State. Number three is Oregon. Again, they will never let me down. They'll fall out of top five. Texas, Bama, Ole Miss. That's an interesting one because I know, like, Lane Kiffin is on a warpath with all the, you know, the NIL stuff. And it's like, look, Tosh.0, just sit back and win your games. Like, he's a good coach. I think he's a he's an offensive coordinator masquerading as a HC, but uh, that's just my opinion. Number seven is Notre Dame. You got the, the state pin at number eight. Michigan, who will probably disappear into obscurity this year once the, the NCAA figures out what they're going to do. Like, I don't know. I'm kind of over it, but I'm not over it. It's, it's an interesting story to watch, so it's college football. And then, of course, uh, last year's Bridesmaid, Florida State, rounds out the top ten. I'm, that's, that's a better list than your uh, FPI, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. But the reality of it is, is like, like for shame, all these people, like, putting the boo birds on, on Florida State, man. I think Florida State is like a – they're trending upwards, and – so they had a, you know, so they had a pretty significant injury that like didn't change the complexity of their game because they still won. Right. So you're undefeated team. And like, rather than all the shenanigans, like post national championship, and this is just me. And I'm sure that like Michigan fans will argue with me until they're blue in the face. But the reality of it is if I was a university of Michigan, I was like, Hey, don't put us in the playoffs, no sanctions. Right. Put Florida state in, We'll sit at home, you know, and we'll take the lick of not playing in the national championship game this year, and then we'll You're move on. Last year, like last year, yeah, that's what There's I'm saying. No way, like there's no way they were gonna do that, dude. Got a look, national championship, that's like the the accomplishment of a century. It, like if Florida State's got to take the loss for them to accomplish their goal of a hundred years or whatever, then that's what's gonna happen, man. Come yeah, but now. what if but if they get four years of sanctions and fall off into obscurity with NIL? What is like, Harbaugh? care he's at the chargers well yeah harbaugh doesn't care but i'm talking about the 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 university itself hang, like hang the banner off the aircraft carrier i'm telling you mission accomplished <laughs> they they did this thing yeah that, that's a fair point i don't know what what are you guys' thoughts market what do you think they're crazy they're crazy up there i don't think it would take them too too long to rebuild back at michigan and i wouldn't be surprised if they're not terrible this year um it's it's pretty nuts up there um, I do expect a little bit more from Ohio State than what's on paper. I think they're going to win a lot of games by a lot of points. Uh, their fans are excruciating, but uh, that's okay. I think they do have a they do have a pretty good football team, and uh, and then we'll see. Don't count any team that's coached by Marcus Freeman out. I mean, he's going to have a good defense up there. They you know they they're trying to be run first. We talked a little bit about Sam Hartman earlier, but that's a run first football team that I think is going to have a good defense, and so I wouldn't count them out. I don't watch much SEC football, so you guys can take that one. Yeah, well, the thing about the SEC is like it's the face of its change as well with with you know 
Texas, then I'm doing this on purpose because like now they're gonna penalize players for doing that. You know, I think that's silly. No, no, no. They didn't they overrule that? They overruled that. They said yeah. you can do that in the SEC. That ain't a foul in the SEC. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how well that goes. You know, you know. But uh, like, why are you why so sensitive? You're Texas. Like, you guys talk so much crap. <laughs> you know, it's like we're allowed to to give you the horns down. I think. But uh, you know, I think that the the sleeper team right now in the SEC of the new guys that have walked in is probably Texas because they still got Quinn Ewers and, you know, an Arch Manning. Like, we'll see what that quarterback duo can do in the SEC because I don't think, like, as as Quinn Ewers is not durable enough to make it through an SEC season. Uh, like, I, I think he's, he's going to get hurt. You did see they need to win early at Michigan, right, September 7th? Yeah, and, and, and that's the other part. So, but – that's the other thing about Michigan schedules. They got some pipe hitters on their schedule. So I feel bad for them because it could be, it could be a, you know, I'm saying 10 and two. I think they'll do well, but they'll drop one or two of those games because they have a pretty high powered schedule. And, and I know that's uh, into the playoff. They'll yeah. We'll, the playoff at 10 and two. Well, give, given the way that the, the sports writers, write, Like, absolutely. Yeah, they will. Absolutely. So it'll be interesting to see, but Dan, we got a commercial. Let's talk about Craig. So if you have listened to this show before, you will know that we have a sponsor here at As for Football, and his name is Craig Oxing, Vice President of Residential Lending at New American Funding in Chicago. Uh, he's a member of the West Point class of 1994, licensed to lend in all 50 states based out of Chicago. Friends, Craig is one of the largest VA lenders in the country, and the reason is because, one, he offers super competitive rates, gives you the best deal he possibly can. Two, he's very easy to work with. He makes an effort to go out of his way to reach out and like really establish a relationship with his clients. And three, he does not charge lending fees for veterans. That's a $1,300 savings on average. I'm telling you, guys, ladies, $1,300. That's what he's going to, that's the, the savings you're going to get from Craig. If you don't need that money, write out a check. Put it in the mail, send it to Rob, address to ask for football. We have got uses for that, I know. So, um, and listen, if you never bought a house before, buying a house is like the most stressful and confusing thing that you have ever done. They give you two inches of paperwork that you have to sign. They definitely threaten to take your firstborn away. Like, this is not the time to deal with some clown who really doesn't care about you and wants to make a buck. You want to deal with somebody who is going to help walk you through that paperwork and who actually cares, and that's Craig. And this is how the West Point Network functions. We even are there for Navy grads. Like, I'm telling you, it's veterans. That's that's This is the audience, right? Craig is helping us stay in business here at Azure Football, and we're trying to help you get the best deal on a mortgage that we possibly can by introducing you to the very man that you need to be. So go to AsherFootball.com, find his little business card there, click on it. You'll be fill out a little questionnaire. You'll be talking to him in a couple of hours. Could not be easier. And with that, I will gladly turn this over to mark for the navy football portion of this thing um tell us about the mids man tell us something good i don't know i honestly don't know if i believe in your new offense so convince me i guess that's that's where we're gonna start well i'm pretty slow getting ramped up um and i think that a lot of us were eager to turn the page last year and sure. just like fans do like we got pretty excited about last year maybe a little bit prematurely um I think this this year, most of our fans, the posture is kind of wait and see, at least from what I can tell uh, from here. But like I mentioned before, there were a lot of changes. Uh, Grant Chesnut was not retained as the offensive coordinator after one season, uh, which could be an indication that things were not not really good behind the scenes. But I don't have any way of knowing that. And then another notable change, it's not like front page news because I didn't know much about him. But Ashley Ingram, who is the assistant head coach. He uh, took the job at Carson Newman. And one thing about Ashley Ingram is he's a big time good recruiter in the Tennessee area oh, wow. and recruited some folks that, you know, Army got accustomed to seeing the backs of their jersey, like namely Keenan Reynolds and, and Malcolm Perry, among others. Yeah. So he got some good players. So he lost a good recruiter and a really good assistant coach. He is a definitely a triple option, you know, traditional under center flex bone guy. His his announcement at Carson Newman was that they were going to model their offense after Navy's 08 to 16 offense, which is kind of prior to uh, the flex bone becoming more of a spread option offense that Neumath Lolo yeah. ran. Yeah, yeah. Um, so after what felt like a long search for offensive coordinator, Navy found Drew Chronic. He's a 50 year old head coach at FCS Mercer. It's happening a little more often that head coaches are becoming coordinators. Um, and he has an overall head coaching record of, of 75 and 23. He's been successful everywhere he's been. 
He's had really prolific offenses. Um, he came up right away, said, I'm a wing T guy, a uh, wing T offensive coordinator and coach. Now, so the wing T is, uh, you know, much like the triple option. It's intended to be a scheme that can work for undersized offensive linemen. Uh, it's a run first offense for sure. Run first, uh, much like the triple option. You know, you'll see coaches leverage a series of plays, uh, the, called the buck series, belly series. I don't know too much about it. But you'll see counters, you'll see uh, reverses, you'll see short passes, you'll see bootlegs. And interestingly, um, the first feature that our beat writer, Bill Wagner, from the Capital Gazette wrote about was the number of passes that they're seeing in practices and uh, Chronic's uh, love of the passing game. In fact, he, his, his offense was nicknamed the Sling Tee at one of his stops. So the interesting thing is, like, he runs enough variations of the offense that it's kind of hard for us to put a finger on what the exact base will look like. Um, but we, we're we pretty sure it's going to be a run-first offense. It's going to include tight ends. And, um, you know, folks, you could get you could get pretty excited about it. But like I said, from at least what I can tell, most fans are kind of in a wait-and-see posture. And uh, and that's, that's where I'll take it for right now. I'm glad that we have a, a, a coach that has shown a lot of success through the years, I think, you know, when we started last year, it was uh, we grabbed Grant Chesnut. And and I think that um, he probably had some really great ideas to counteract the changes in the blocking schemes. Um, but I think we're in a different position now with a, with a, a very successful offensive mind and an experienced head coach on the defensive side. We return a ton of starters. Rayon Lane is incredible as a safety. We've got some good corners as well. Uh, the defense was a little bit. Um, uh, not quite as consistent last year. So we're hoping for some consistency on that side of the ball, but still looking pretty strong there. So uh, overall, I think the program made some, some pretty good moves and some pretty important moves. But again, we're, I think we're kind of in a wait and see type of thing. So the interesting thing is, you know, army army went with the experimental offense last year. And as I said, I've, that we, that had to happen. I don't, didn't necessarily go the way that they wanted, but they had to do it. Right. And I think they got out a, a lot out of attempting it. Um, where Army struggled last year was they would they would run, and then defenses would adjust to what they were trying to run, and then pass passing lanes would open up, and they just couldn't hit those passes. So I'll be very curious to see if Navy can make that work because I, I could probably talk for five minutes about why I think that that didn't work, but it didn't, and you know here we are. So. If you guys can hit those passes, I think that offense is going to work great. And if you can't, I'll be interested. You know, maybe it'll still work. I don't know. Um, but I'm I'm curious. That's what I'm most curious about at this point. And well, a couple things. Is, I mean, go ahead. I, you know, I think for both teams, like you'll see, you know, and again, like there's no consistency in the teams in the ACC anymore. They turn everybody over. There are There is some consistency in the coaches. And consistency in the players and the coaches are, are, you know, is really a key element of stopping the triple option offense out of the flex bone, especially. Um, last season, though, Navy saw a lot of defenses. And one game that's notable is Temple. You'll see a lot of safeties just sprinting downhill to the play side. And you have misdirection and you have play action to counter that. And I think that there were some Navy fans were like, OK, when's it coming? When are we going to hit the play action or when are we going to run some misdirection? And instead, I think the scheme last year, from what I could tell, was based on getting more blockers to the outside and seeing if we can hit the big play to the outside. So both for Army and for Navy this year, I think it's going to be really important to see, you know, with the blocking rule changes and with AAC defenses that, in, at least in my mind, look a little more aggressive from the secondary, are they able to hit those plays? Are they able to keep safeties back on their heels? And I, I think that has yet to be seen. Yeah, that's fair. Um, yeah, I will also say y'all always have that one really outstanding inside linebacker. Um, and, and that's, it, it's, it's frustrating because, you know, you're going into the army Navy game and it's like, okay, I think this is going to work. And I think this is going to work and I'm not sure this is going to work. And Oh, by the way, they've got this one like outstanding linebacker that I don't know how the hell they're going to neutralize that guy. And it always ends up being like 14 to 10 with that guy has 35 tackles. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, do you, you know, one thing that I think like I won't speak for anybody else. I'll just speak for myself. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit tired of CIC games going 10, seven, you oh, know, yeah. with 130 yards of total offense for each team. Do you get, does, does army have anything different planned? Do you think for these games, do you think they're scheming up something in particular to get away from the triple or what, what are you guys hearing? I, I know that Jeff Munkin is passionately trying to figure that out. I just think it's harder than it looks. Yeah. 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 I mean the quote, yeah. Yeah. The quote uh, that he had last year was like, man, like, 
if somebody throws a hand grenade, we're going to kill all 22 players, you know, like that's his kind of perspective on it. So it's like, Hey, how do we open up the offense to go back to the wing T really quick? Like I played wing T ball in high school, so I'm old as crap, but uh, the offense, what, what it will do to mitigate a lot of the, uh, to a lot of the, the, the safety just rushing to the play side is there going to be a ton of pre-snap eye candy, right? So your Mm -hmm. wing backs are going to be motioning. Your tailbacks are going to be motioning, you know, it's it's 20 trap 36 sweep for those of you guys that know what i'm talking about you know exactly what i mean but those that don't it's it's going to be a lot of eye candy so you're going to get the wing back in motion fake to the full back counter pitch option you know so it's 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 still a triple option it's not the traditional look that you're normally used to seeing but it's very very hard to defend plus if you're like the type of defensive coach that wants to put everybody on the line or start pressuring to try and get to the play side when that wing back goes in motion, oh crap, you know, do I cover the tight end with my safety? And then that's when you hit them with the pass or do I send somebody to follow that tail back in motion? And that, again, it goes back to how much trust does the coaching staff having that quarterback to make the right decision when it comes to making the offense play. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So one thing I wanted to talk about is, we're just coming into the American conference. What is it that we are about to learn the hard way uh, from somebody who's been living this for a couple of years now? Yeah. If you ask me, um, I question the speed in your defensive secondary against some of the teams that have some speed on the outside. That's, that's been a tricky thing, even for some really good uh, Brian Newberry defenses to figure out, uh, you know, what are you doing when, when you're playing corners on first down and, and they're ready to throw it deep. Um, I think that's been very tricky to figure out from time to time um, on the on the defensive side. And then um, on the offensive side, I, like I said before, I think it's it's going to be very important to have some some tricks up your sleeve if they do put all their if they do put everybody in the box and they want to get really aggressive about jumping into the backfield and, and sending yeah, uh, yeah. safeties downhill. That'll be interesting uh, for sure. I, I'm so Army's defense has kind of a lot of returning guys who have played defense not returning starters but guys who have played but they've got two new sophomore cornerbacks and if i was scheming against that defense i'd be trying to figure out how to put them on an island and throw at them and maybe they're going to be great players but that's obviously where you start i gotta give you guys a hard time though like the the schedule that you have is not that bad for first year in the acc and i don't i think you don't play memphis for the first two seasons in the acc in the aac rather Man, well, the, I was computer, like, the, the computers make the schedule. Yeah, I don't. Know. <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and you you can't. I know you can't make too much out of like preseason rankings and stuff like that. But I I think I saw somebody had you guys rated as like the thirteenth toughest AAC schedule for this year, and I was like, that's that's a nice way to ease into the conference. It's definitely the way to draw it up. That's how you would draw it up. Yeah, for sure. No, no yeah. argument. We it, yeah. listen. Um, we we could have caught Tulane at home or at home. You know, Tulane on the road, could have caught Memphis on the road, could have, yeah, I mean, could have caught USF on the road in freaking August. Like, like a lot of stuff could have gone worse than it went. And uh, I don't know, next year, I, I think we'll see how it goes. I will say, I think Rice is very undervalued. You know, they mm-hmm. return a lot of people. Uh, that coaching staff is good. And I think people are just so used to them being a doormat that that's the way they think it's going to be. But Rice, don't forget, to too, like, in fact, I, just made tickets i'll be at that game uh it's kurt warner's kid who yeah, carved us yeah, yeah. i mean he carved us up in philly last year playing for temple and yeah. and then once we saw that he had transferred to rice uh you know not looking forward to seeing that again he had a, he had an incredible game against us in philly and now i gotta go watch him in houston he's he's good that team is i mean they won four games in the conference if they win six games in the conference we're talking about maybe they can vie for a chance to go to the championship are they gonna pull it off I don't know, but is it unreasonable to think they might get to six wins in the conference? No, that, they might do that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm worried about that. And ECU is another team that, you know, they were terrible last year, but they were this close to being really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Well, and, and like I said, the, the, the buzz in North Carolina is ECU is going to do something this year. Like everybody has high, super high expectations of ECU and NC State and like not in the conference, but those two teams – are like earmarked for greatness, according to all the local sports reporters, is like they're they're anticipating a you know a decent year for both NC State and ECU. 
Now, I don't know what that means. For ECU, that might be two wins, right? Because they did not look so hot last year, and there's a lot of parity, you know, in the AAC. So, like, who knows? But locally, the buzz here in NC is, like, these teams are going to come out and, and, and show up big this year. So, they'll be interesting to see. And speaking of teams showing up big, let's dive right into the games of the week. We only got four this week, so it's very, very easy. I'm picking two. I don't know what you're going to pick, Mark, but uh, first things first, uh, you got Florida State there at uh, minus 11 against Georgia Tech in Dublin, Ireland. That kicks at noon on ESPN this Saturday. You've got Montana State in New Mexico. That's on FS1. New Mexico is uh, 10 and a half point dogs. And you've got SMU at Nevada. That's 8 p.m. on CBS Sports Network. And for those of you guys that have Spectrum pay-per-view, good Lord, if you do, you can watch the Delaware State-Hawaii matchup. And uh, normally they don't give too many big lines on those because it's an FCS team, but there's actually 39 and a hook, plus 39 and a hook for Delaware State at Hawaii. Dano, who, who are you picking this week? Uh, you know what? I'll pick two since you said you're going to pick two. So I'm going to pick Florida State to cover. So Florida State minus 11. And uh, I, you know what? I'm going to take Montana State minus 10 and a half at New Mexico for the wild ass FCS upset. I don't even know why I couldn't name one player on Montana State, but it's I've never, ever seen a, an FBS team go as a home dog to an FCS school. Certainly not by two scores. So, you know what? That's just crazy enough to work. All right. Sounds good to me. Mark, how about you? I'm going to go boring. I'm going to bore you guys. I'm going to take Florida State to cover, and I'm going to take SMU to cover. That's fair. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit risky, so I did a do, do a little bit of deep dive on FanDuel today. I'm going to take the over on Florida State and Georgia Tech of 55. I think Florida State will probably hang 50 of those 55 points, <laughs> you know, and there'll be a field goal and a safety off of something goofy. But uh, the reality of it is I think Florida State has, has to put a stamp on the, the season early and not lose any momentum. So if they can hang 70, they'll probably hang 70 on Georgia Tech. I don't know if they will, but they have to come out strong because, you know, that playoff performance, that was the worst bowl game of the playoff era, you know, of the the New Year six, like 63 to three. They've got, they've got something to prove as a team. And then uh, take Delaware State to cover at Hawaii. I don't know. If, I don't think that there's going to be – dude, like Hawaii is terrible. We saw Delaware State. I saw them play in person. Yeah, and, and Hawaii is terrible. All right, so yeah. I'm going to take them okay. to cover. I, I mean, it's a bold choice. I know. It, yeah. You know, we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> for sure, hey, we're, you know, we're God go bless ahead. you for uh, doing something controversial on the show. Oh, I got something controversial. Do we get? Are we going to do this? Can we? Sure. Can we on. talk about? Can we talk about fifth year seniors? Oh, oh at Army? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So. Okay, so for those folks that didn't follow all that closely, um, I think the the big bomb in January, I think it was, was when the AD at Army, Mike Buddy, clapped back on Twitter at our beat reporter, uh, Bill Wagner, and it, there was just a quick back and forth about you know fifth year, fifth year seniors and stuff like that. And so, look, like I just have one thing to say about this: like this sucks. And I'll say, it, just hear me out. Sure, sure. No, go for it. I, I like, already know what I'm going to say, and I think we agree on this, but go ahead. I am in no position to criticize the Naval Academy for the way COVID was handled. I have no thoughts for players who decided to leave during COVID. Like, you know what I mean? That's yeah. You can't comment on that whatsoever, and, you know, I don't have any judgment. But the truth is, it, it hurt the roster. I mean, when we beat you guys in 21, we had six seniors on the roster. Six yeah. seniors. Last year yeah. still had 10 freshmen on the kickoff return team. So we've been looking forward to this time, you know, where we, we can build up our roster as it would be in normal years. Um, and then I also have no comments for the way that, you know, Army's going to handle kid goes home in the spring or gets injured or whatever is going to graduate in December, whether or not he should play. Like I have no interest in talking about service academy policy or anything like that. But what you just you just have a bunch of Navy fans who are eager to be like, look, we've got we've got our team built up. We've got a roster full of seniors. And you look like after these years, after COVID, we're like, finally, maybe it's going to happen. And then you look over and it's like, wait a second, they have 50 or seniors. Like, what's going on? And then internally, we've decided not to do that. And it's just like, man, it's just it's a little bit deflating, you know, uh, and that's so that's it. Yeah. So so I'm going to agree with you that it's deflating. Um, and the reason is because, as you already noted, it is hard enough to keep up in college football as a service academy 
and now you're going to turn around and tie your hands behind your back and nobody asked you to and you know you've got kids who have given you three three and a half years at the naval academy who would like to commission into the navy and and they're football players and we all know that they have to do a sport why do i need him these guys to go out for intramural swimming when they've got football like they can they can play that's that's how i feel about it now i don't speak for mike buddy um i'm not going to apologize for what he said i'm not going to try to explain <laughs> what he said i don't have to i know it was good fun to. for us on twitter it was if just I, fun if i uh if i had to do it i know what i would say but since i don't have to yeah. you know what yeah but but yeah. i listen dudes have got to play like it's not optional you got to play something yeah, I think it. I think it'll just be a, a fun point of controversy to to go back and forth on. Um, and like I said, I I I do not want to talk about service academy policy. That's just not my thing. From a football yeah. standpoint, it, we'd we'd love to get a win against you guys, even under the circumstances. You know. Yeah, I I, I think my point on this, and then we'll, we'll we'll wrap the show. But my point on this, the big thing is like, look, thank God this is the last year that we have to deal with COVID. This virus yeah. has been yeah. a royal pain in the ass. So you literally have players from 2016 until 2024 affected by this. And like at the end of the day, like, dude, man, Frank Harris is now the mayor of San Antonio, Texas, Mm -hmm. because he spent so much time at UTSA. And we say that jokingly all the time, but the dude played for like what, seven seasons. And like, there's one kid that literally had all this eligibility because he would transfer, have to sit out a year. And I think he had like, one guy had like seven or or no, it was closer to like nine years in college football Mm -hmm. because of the, yeah, because of the COVID year and all the other eligibility shenanigans that happened. And to be quite frank, I think those should be the exceptions, you know, and those are like really, really exceptions. But like if you're, you know, if you're a college athlete, like the the goal is to get a degree. And unfortunately, with name, image and likeness, it's too easy, you know, with everywhere but the service academies to like park your ass on a bench at a college football program and makes money, you know, and I don't know if yeah. that's right or wrong. You know, I'm not arguing that because that's the state of college football. But uh, I will be glad when this season is over just from the fact that we don't have to deal about like, oh, he's got a COVID year. Like, good Lord, how many COVID years is this kid going to take? Yeah, I got to say that I have gotten concerned that kids are just going to take the money, what seems like a lot of money at 18 and and turns out to be less than 100 grand. And so they're going to be like, okay. I'm not going to get this degree. I'm going to get this hundred grand. And like, it's a lot when you're 18. Sure. But your goal now is not even to get that degree anymore because guess what? You are an employee of the football team, whether, whether we call it that or not. And your coach really doesn't care because you're physically getting a paycheck to be there. So, um, yeah, that's bad. And those guys do not have anything like a guarantee that they're going to make the NFL. I mean, that hundred grand is not going to take you very far. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I am legitimately concerned about that and it's good that that guys have a chance to make money and that they're not getting used but you gotta but you gotta you gotta use a sport you don't let the sport use you I yeah we can talk for half an hour about that too but yeah but keep keep in mind there was a fabulous espn 30 for 30 years ago called broke right and these young kids when they get into you know flush with cash they're gonna make young person's mistakes regardless of what team they're on right so we have to be you have to be mindful of that and and that's that's basically all I have left on that topic. But we'll move on to the end of the show so we can close this thing out. But I, I quick question, just a thought. What do you guys think about the two minute warning being added to college football? I mean, like I've heard some of the prognosticators and some of the broadcast companies are like, Yeah, this is great for us because it gives us that extra commercial for marketing time. You know, we just and, we just shortened the games. We just yeah. we just shortened the games. And I completely understand that, but like you literally have people, you know, talking about like, yeah, this is great for our broadcast partners because we know that that's two guaranteed commercials, you know, in the second and fourth quarter. That's fu- Listen, I wasn't even in favor of shorter games, but we just shortened the game. I, yeah, it's, but it's- but again, like, is it was it was it legitimately? And I say that was it legitimately done for revenue, or was it done because like? Hey, it helps coaches out because they now have four timeouts and a half. You know, I don't know. It was done for revenue. Oh yeah, absolutely. Business. Everybody yeah. got to get paid, even players, which is fine, but it's a business. 
Yeah, you got to get that one last Bud Light commercial in. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, look, like I'm a big baseball guy, and all these changes they've made, I think, has really improved the game, whether or not I felt good about it or not. Some of these things, like I'm old enough now that I'm asking my kids, what do you think about it? And so that's where I take a decision like this. But that's only the right question to ask if you're talking about, is this going to make the game more exciting? And so do we think it makes the game more exciting? I'm not so sure. I would say probably no. Um, but I can, like, if my kids are like, yeah, we love the two minute warning. Then I'm like, go ahead and do it. Yeah, that's fair. That's, that's fair. And and I'll close with this point. Like my personal feeling on this is I don't like the fact that college football is turning into oversized farm league. I mentioned that before. Like, I would like to see the effect because like, if you look at the, if you look at the UFL, like it was a, it was a goat rope, right? Cause think about it. It was a goat rope in the UFL because now with name, image, and likeness, kids are going to stay out. So you can have a talented guy that may have went to the pros in the NFL made the practice squad and then tries out for the XFL or something like that. But now with name, image, and likeness, like I'm going to hang out in college as long as I can, because I can get paid. And I think, you know, NIL is going to hurt like the, the semi pro leagues, you know, like XFL yeah. or the UFL because players aren't going to come like, like I'm like, I got a better NIL deal when I was in college and you're offering me $55,000 on housing stipend. Like who's going to take that? And the play on the field shows, you you know, even though even though it was better than it was previous years, it's still not as good as it can be because they're not getting the talent that that used to come out of out of college. I don't know. Jury's still out on that. But with all that being said, I will wrap the show up. This has been uh, the college football roundtable. Uh, Great to have it open for the public like we're going to do this all season so the round table will be open so you know mark the like and subscribe i hate to say that to the s for football web page or the s for football <laughs> youtube page so you know when we're coming on you know hit click that button hit the bell so you know when we're coming live and i say that jokingly but like the reality of it is we're doing this for you guys to bring you in to give you an opportunity to kind of talk college football and not to uh, not hang your hat on anyone in particular so you can you know talk a little crap in the in the chat box and and really just break down college football and enjoy it from our perspective. Uh, yeah. No trigger Joe this week. Uh, we'll, we'll rouse his cage. Uh, I know he's dealing with a new baby that uh, just came along a couple weeks ago. So we're, we're glad for him and his family on that one football or your baby. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're trying to teach your baby to carry a football, you know, he does live up the street from the big house, man. Like we may see a future tailback at, uh, at U of M. So he's probably working on that right now. He's catching passes in the crib. Anyway, uh, thanks for joining us here at the college football round table. I'm your host, Rob calling out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. We've got Dano Icabesa calling to you out of coastal Connecticut and joining us again. Uh, again, we will probably not like you after this week because college football <laughs> kicks off. Mark, you're always welcome to come on a, a on a off-season show, yeah, but once the back, season gets started... season and let's talk about that wing tee. I'm dead serious, whether <laughs> it's working or not. Yeah, we'll, we'll have, you, we'll have you back on, but it, it may not be as uh, kind and gentle the yeah, next exactly. time around, but we always appreciate yeah. having you guys come on. Uh, we really appreciate all of you guys for joining us. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon. Go to askforfootball.com. All the information is there. And I can't plug this thing anymore. So, as always, beat Navy. Oh, hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Ask for Football College Football Roundtable. Join the AFF team next week for more hot takes and college football analysis. If you like the show and you want to support us, consider signing up for our Patreon at Ask for Football or opting into our mailing list at askforfootball.com forward slash subscribe. We'll catch you guys next week, and as always, beat...